Let's begin. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, my name is Brian Alexander. I'm the Chief Forum Cat Herder, Creator, and Host, and I'm delighted to see you all here today. I'm looking forward to hearing from you as we proceed. Now, I'd like to welcome this week's guest. I'm just excited as I can be uh, to welcome Casey Green. Um, Casey is well known to people in the ed tech world as someone who created and has been running the campus computing project for Casey, is it 30 years now? This year, 2019, marks the 30th survey, Brian. 30 years, Casey. This is fantastic, fantastic work. I'm a big fan because for my money, this is the freshest, most actionable, and cold-eyed look at the data about how campuses actually use digital technology. Um, Thank you. That's quite a compliment. Casey, this is great stuff, and I'm really uh, congratulations on having this run for so long, so successfully. Thank you. Let, let me ask, where are you coming from today? I'm broadcasting from an undisclosed location. That's the <laughs> world headquarters of Campus Computing in Studio City, California. This is a uh, Campus Computing Towers. The uh, could camp, be. Campus <laughs> Computing Bunker. Yes. Yeah, Bunker. Um, I, I think Bunker is a better ref metaphor. Well, for, for me, the Bunker, you know, I, I ask people to introduce themselves a lot of ways, but my favorite way is to ask, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the, what are the big topics that are and projects that are going to be uh, uh, concerning you? Is it going to be the run-up to the 2020 uh, report? You know, the, the survey, Brian, and again, my thanks to your audience for their time um, and, and you for this forum. The survey is now 30 years. Um, it gets increasingly difficult to do this, not because people don't fill out the damn questionnaire. You know, we used to get seven, 800 responses in the early years of the survey. We barely inched into 235 this year. Um, you know, for folks who do data, you know, and if you do it well, data, it's, it's not about a, a data point. It's about weaving a narrative, not right. telling a false narrative, but, but essentially the sum is more than the parts. And I can still do that with 235 questionnaires. It just, the fabric's not as tightly woven in, is when we start to look at sectors mm. and segments. Mm. And, and the challenge has always been everybody wants the survey, but nobody wants to fill out the damn questionnaire. The survey is half the length that it used to be. It's now online. Um, we try to do everything we can to make it easier for folks to do it. And, and yet each year I have to kind of throw myself at the mercy of the Educause CIO list, pleading with folks to complete the questionnaire. So to those of you who completed the questionnaire, my thanks. For those of you Woo. who don't, we've got your name and we'll hound you next year as well. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Well, let, let's let, let me ask a little bit about a little, a little bit more background about this, just to uh, flesh this out for everybody. And let me just let me just say for everybody here, the purpose of the forum is your questions and comments. I, I have tons of questions that I can ask, but your questions are much more interesting, much more diverse, and reveal a far broader background than I could ever hope to achieve. So as we go, please start thinking about these. And again, one thing to think about too is. Uh, the more a basic question, an advanced question, we're good for all of this. Um, so let me just ask, uh, Casey, to begin with, in the U.S., there's about 4,300 colleges and universities. How many responses, or how many of them respond to your study? Right, so we had 235 this year, but that 4,000, that 4,300 is a useless number, Brian, for a lot of reasons. Um, many of those are for-profit, and the number of for-profits, mm -hmm. as, as many in your audience know, has been diminishing in recent years. The mm -hmm. other part is if you look at the demography of American higher education, and you would do it graphically, it's a large head and a small tail. Mm -hmm. There are about 650 institutions that enroll more than 10,000 students. That represents almost 60% of the headcount. Mm -hmm. There are another 1,000 institutions that, rep that enroll less than 1,000. Mm -hmm. And yet they represent 25% of the institutional count. And yet, and, and they are often very small, very specialized. So th this is not about a single number representing all of higher ed. You really need to look at sectors and segments. And, and again, I'm very cautious when people say 4,300 institutions. That's really, that's not the core of the marketplace, I guess is the most polite way to, to describe it. It is a large head, long tail kind of market. And, and for a lot of the conversation about technology, the action or the interest or the policy questions are really involving the large head, large public and pro, uh, private universities, community colleges, which enroll almost 60% right. of undergraduates. Right. Uh, and many of those are non-degree students who are coming back for individual courses after having completed a degree. Um, it, it is to use the overused term, it's an incredibly rich and diverse population, but it's also one number doesn't adequately reflect what's going on in any one of these sectors or segments. 
do you in so in your in your results especially over say the past 10 years i mean are there particular sectors that really respond more highly than others you know it, it's mixed i mean we're fortunate to get about 50 60 community colleges so that's nice. uh, about 5 7% of the headcount we typically get nice. more public universities and public four year institutions and we get privates the the numbers actually and by the way for those of you who are looking for the slides the full campus computing report is up on the website at campuscomputing.net that includes my educause presentation last week um, the narrative the overview uh, the narrative Brian mentioned that these are fresh data. I don't know if think Brian understands how fully fresh these data are. These data locked on Tuesday and were presented at Educause on Wednesday. So it, it really is that these are very fresh data in terms of, of coming directly from IT office, senior, uh, CIOs and senior IT officers, working through those data, double checking the data, looking at it, creating the data tables, the presentation, and looking at the narrative and say, what are the key issues? There's, it's a four-page questionnaire. There's a lot of data points. Where must attention be paid? This year, in terms of the lead, the attention was about the ongoing issues of unemployment and, and also the fact that a new item on the survey was large numbers of CIOs don't think that their presidents, CAOs, and mm -hmm. CFOs know very much or very engaged in, in understanding IT. Let me pause you for a second. Um, I, I, I want to... Um... Uh, welcome people who've just been piling in, folks like Joe and Jeff and Leah. I'm glad to see all of you all here. Um, I've been describing this data as about one week old, and I think that's pretty close. Huh? Two, actually, if you think from the freeze date, which was Two October 8th, up. October 9th, something like that. So this is right out of the campus computing kitchen. Um, Still fresh. This is great stuff. This is great stuff. Um, so let me let me begin by asking about these about these issues. Um, the first issue that you were just talking about, the one that uh, Inside Higher Ed wrote about, is the sense that um, CIOs have that the rest of academic leadership is not fully cognizant of the challenges. Is that where we are? I think that's right. We had about forty percent who said that they thought that their presidents, you know, with plus or minus, their presidents, their CAOs, provosts, and CFOs were well informed. That means sixty percent. Not now. Understand the scale that we use is a one to seven Likert. You know, not informed, well informed, and we report the data for those who say six or seven, the most positive. So you can say, well, it's okay, maybe. But I, th I think it's what's quite telling is the most, you know, the well informed, very engaged uh, in, in terms of understanding the narrative and understanding the issues. I want to emphasize, and, and this is this what came through the higher ed, the Inside Higher Ed article. The, the closing sentence. This is not about technology. It's what the technology touches. And, mm -hmm. and I think the mm -hmm. second part of this, in thinking about today's presidents, provosts, and CFOs, this is not 1982. This is not 1990. This is not 1995. All these folks are now somewhere between 45 and 65 mm -hmm. or older. They have all mm -hmm. now come of age personally, professorially, and professionally with the technology that's gone from unique to ubiquitous. And from a, a planning, a programmatic, and a policy set of issues. Again, it's not the technology, it's what the technology touches, and the technology touches almost everything on a college campus as it does in mm -hmm. consumer life as well. Sure. And a lot of the expectations about our, from our clientele, whether they're students ranging 16 to 68, 68 our faculty, our staff, our, our administrative support folks, a lot of their expectations about technology are driven by their experiences on the consumer side when they come to campus. Mm -hmm. Why can't I do that? Right. Why is the analog right. experience or resource not available to me? And it is the case that we lag. And, yeah. and that, that too is, I think, part of the challenge. We are underfunded. Uh, I may be getting ahead of the narrative you want to focus on, Brian, but it is the case that despite the Great Recession began in 2008, we continue to see from the annual survey, large numbers of campuses are experiencing budget cuts and mid-year budget rescissions. Those are, have compounding consequences. There is no let up in demand for resources and services even as campuses, particularly community colleges and public four institu institutions, continue to experience budget cuts. This is nuts. This is stupid. Um, this is unfortunate, and this has severe consequences. And so, again, I come back to that it's not the technology. It's what the technology touches. This is part of the essential infrastructure in higher ed. It really is. It really is. Um, we, have, uh, we have one question that has come up already. Um, in fact, let me uh, bring this fellow up on stage so he can uh, address it. Uh, let's see, so if you haven't seen this before, this is this is how easy it is to do. Um, hello, Tom, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Perfectly, where okay. are you? 
Awesome. Where are you from? I don't see your your blue house. Oh no, I'm in. Uh, I'm actually at the institute, and I'm actually sitting in one of the the sound booths because I forgot to take my headset with me today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was not as nice. Sound insulated place where I can talk without having a lot of echo and background noise going on at the same time. So worked out nicely. Um, <clears throat> Tom, so, I may, if um, I may, you. Yeah. Would, for my purposes, at least, and perhaps for others, would you introduce yourself so at least sure. my hyperactive inference engine can make inappropriate assumptions while you ask a question? <laughs> well, I'm easily, I'm easy, I, it's easy to make assumptions about me because I'm everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, Tom Hames, um, I consult on a number of different areas, including learning spaces, uh, technology. I'm a former technology director for one of the colleges at Houston Community College, and I'm faculty here as well. So I actually eat my own dog food. Um, and uh, I am in the, bu the building I'm in right now, actually, I was large part in designing and building it, and it's an innovation center, and uh, I teach my classes in here as well. So, and I make heavy use of technology, uh, but I do it in a way that is, um, I develop my, needs first, my ends in product, what I want to get my students doing and so on and so forth. And then I sort of figure out what technologies are going to get me there and which ones I don't don't want to mess with because they, they, they get in the way and they're distracting. I guess that's the, the 15 second uh, version of, of, of that. That's great. Um, so, um, so the question I have for you it has to do with that actually, and that is, you know, a lot of times, and I haven't looked. I, I confess I haven't. I've sort of been flipping through your slides in the last few minutes, but I have not done a detailed uh, analysis of what you got there. But um, is making this connection? I mean, a lot of times when we see statistics about technology, it's a counting statistic. You know, we have Wi-Fi over ninety-five percent of the campus, and we have um, projectors and. 80, you know, 88% of the classrooms or that sort of thing, right? Um, and I know that you have to have the basic infrastructure to be able to go anywhere. But um, I, my question is making that qualitative connection to what's actually enhancing learning, teaching and learning on, this, on, on, on campus as opposed to, you know, simply providing what most people consider to be basic infrastructure from Starbucks, you know? Uh, you know, the, All right, so the, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit yeah. and try to just got conscious of time. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. The reality is, we do a crappy job of evaluation mm. year in and year out. There's been okay. a question on the campus computing survey: Do you evaluate your investments in IT for ROI or impact? And overwhelmingly, 75% don't. So it, it's still right. the case that, that large parts of what we do on the not just the teaching and learning side, but the operational side, the administrative side as well, in terms of these investments are driven by epiphany and opinion or crowdsourced as opposed to any kind of evidence. And that's just nuts. It's, you know, we, we right. make these investments. Um, we don't evaluate what we do. We don't learn from, it's not an iterative process. It really is the case that everything we teach our graduate students to do in whatever industry that they go into, mm -hmm. or our undergraduates as well, we, we don't do ourselves. And so, right. yes, it's easy to pour money into toys. It's easy to pour money into you know, sort of the easy parts of the, the, the infrastructure that people are demanding, you know, more Wi-Fi, more stuff. The other part, though, it, it, I would say the soft touch part of the infrastructure, we do a crappy job. I mean, look at the survey numbers. Let alone think about your own experience for folks in the audience. Mm -hmm. Only one in 10 of the survey participants think they do a good job on student IT training. Only 20% they think that they do it for faculty. And, and even though 45% think that they were a good job of um, user support services, yet user support services was among the, the, the top four items. I mean, this is as much a part of the infrastructure as is the hardware. If you go look through the slides, for those of you in the mm -hmm. audience, you'll see that on the, the ratings and evaluation about what we do well or how would you rate the infrastructure, they're color-coded. There's things that we buy that are kind of plug and play. Right. There are things that we buy that we have to add value to, and there's things that we do. And, and certainly the stuff we do, we don't do well. This would be user support. So a lot of the stuff that we buy and then have to add to, we don't do well as well. The stuff that we, we think we do well is essentially the stuff that's plug and play. Yeah, we'll, you know, we'll put more access points in for networks. Yeah, you know, we'll do a better job of data communication. Yeah, we'll put more toys into classrooms. I mean, right. Infrastructure, you know, it's, it, infrastructure is linked to innovation. If you don't have the infrastructure there, you're not gonna get innovation. And the other part is people won't use it. They don't feel comfortable. And they don't trust it, so they avoid it. Right. So, how do you change uh, the conversation around 
since you're since you're primarily concerned with measuring this, how do you change the conversation around that? Well, one is you bake in evaluation with any kind of campus initiative. Sure. Okay. So if it's toys, you know, essentially it's hard. It's it's hardware into a classroom. Start tracking the user. You know, the, the user numbers. How many hours right. a day? If it's uh, an initiative in widgets in a particular department, then you got to do A/B testing. You got to do some kind of formal right. evaluation of a curriculum innovation. Um, the other thing, also, and, and I wrote about this on my blog two years ago. Presidents and provosts ought to get a technology tutor. Honestly, yeah. hmm. I, I, and I say this drawing on the experience, not on campus, but on the experience of both Bill Gates and Lou Gerstner. You know, if you go back in history, you know, it wasn't Bill Gates discovering the Internet. It was the undergraduates who poured into Microsoft in the early 1990s who hmm. finally kicked ass on the adults who in their cells were only in their early 30s hmm. to say something is happening here and mm -hmm. you're oblivious to it. And that ultimately led to Gates writing the Internet Tsunami Memo in 1995 that, right. that literally right. changed the direction of the company from focusing on operating systems and applications to recognizing the Internet is the future. Similarly, when Lou Gerstner arrived at IBM as the first outside executive officer coming from a tobacco company to reinvent IBM in 1990, 1991, one of the things he did, because I was doing work for IBM at the time, when he went to the Armagh headquarters, he showed up in a blue shirt. This was heresy. But the other thing he did, if you think about you know, sort of the culture of IBM, but the other thing he did is he brought young IBM scientists into his office as technology tutors. Mm -hmm. And it, what's interesting to me is in my conversations with presidents and provosts, yeah, they can rattle off, oh, we're doing X and we're doing Y, and faculty member Z is doing this stuff. But when, they, when, when it gets personal in terms of the technology stuff is when they start talking about their children and their grandchildren, and then you see their eyes light up. <laughs> and so my thought about a technology tutor is not an undergraduate who's doing show and tell, but just mm -hmm. to understand this stuff and to elevate the lowest common denominator of understanding and conversation for presidents and provosts to, uh, to have a better sense. Yeah. On the flip side, we need to acknowledge that because students are Gen Z and millennials, not all of them are wired. I mean, too often I, I have conversations with faculty members as I'm traveling around the country who acknowledge what I call the GGTT portfolio. Hmm. That too many of our undergraduates, you know, their technology skills, we assume that they can do this stuff. It's Google gaming, text, and Twitter. And they're dead in the water if they can't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. These are day one skills that are as critical as having access to a textbook on day one. And unless Absolutely. we provide our students ages 16 to 68 with some assessed prior to arrival assessment tools, you want to be successful, you need to be able to do this on day one. This is not 1969 when I was an undergraduate and I could avoid the library tour and play catch up. You need these resources and these skills on day one. Here's a self-assessment tool. Here's some online tutorial before you arrive so you can have these skills. So every college needs to form an office of technology assessment. Just like Congress needs one. Well, yeah, uh, the feds used to have an OTA. They killed right, it I years know. ago. Gingrich, Gingrich yeah. killed it. Gingrich got rid of it. Uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. And of course, the scary thing about your your comment was that in both instances, with Gerstner and Gates, um, that was technically a receptive audience. I mean, they considered themselves to be in the technology business from the get go. If a college doesn't think it's in the technology business or a college chancellor or president or, 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 or board member doesn't think, well, we're not in the technology business, mm. um, they're not going to be, they're not going to, you're not even going to get to step one with that. I mean, okay, and, again, I, I don't, my apologies for cutting you off. It's not right. about the technology. It's what the technology touches and the technology touches everything. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, absolutely. And, I, and that I, you and I agree 110% on that. And that's, that's my frustration. That's why I asked the question is how do we change that conversation? Um, and whether or not there's an addendum to your report or a potential additional part of that that needs to be, you know, where you where you. Well, the addendum is the stuff I periodically post on my blog at Inside Higher Ed. Admittedly, it's nourished, but if yeah. you want to see the piece about presidents, it's there. Yeah. If you want to see a piece on provost as the new wave of digital lead, the third wave of digital leadership that was posted this summer. Um, you want there's a piece two years ago about innovation and the fear of trying. The fact mm -hmm. is folks don't do it because they don't get recognized and rewarded. Maybe well, some other folks have some questions. Spe yeah. Speaking of leadership, hey, Tom, thank you very, very much. And oh, uh, Tom, what's, what's the name of your center there where you're coming from? The West Houston Institute. 
Great place. Great place. So, I'm, I'm, by the way, if I, I have to bail a little early and go deal with those very students we're talking about because I have a two o'clock class, but that Understood. doesn't mean I'm not leaving because I'm bored or I hate the discussion. So Understood. thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we have a question from Ed Gray, uh, which is specifically about uh, leadership. Ed, I think you're muted. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, hi, Casey. Good to um, see you. Hi, Ed. My name is uh, Ed Gray, and I'm um, I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois, Chicago. But for many years, I've been uh, very engaged with uh, teaching and learning technologies, learning spaces, and all of that stuff, uh, which I directed for many years at UIC. Um, Casey uh, and, and Brian, for that matter, the question is, is anybody measuring the effect of not having CIOs report to provost have, if any, on, on the focus and the priorities or the levels of focus and priorities um, given to teaching and learning with technology uh, groups within the campuses? So I, and I don't know if I was measuring it. Uh, to me, this is a cultural issue. In the early years of the, the movement towards the formal CIO position some two decades ago, I used to get phone calls. Hi, I'm calling from Acme College. We're having a conversation about a CIO position as opposed to a vice president for something or a director of something. Right. You're the survey guy, right? Yeah, I'm the survey guy. So, you know, from your current survey, what percentage of campuses have CIOs? It's X. What about campuses like us? It's Y. What was it two years ago? It was Z. That's great. Thanks. Um, no, don't don't go away. What do you mean don't go away? The number is meaningless. What do you mean the number is meaningless? You're the survey guy, right? You trust your data? Yeah, I trust my data, but the number is meaningless. Why is the number meaningless? Because this is about culture. This is about context. And, and if you look at the history of CIO positions, these things ebb and flow. They move like a pendulum back and forth. So in many cases, for example, if you think about the evolution of CIOs over 30 years, in the beginning, they were, and I say this respectfully, but a little flippantly, they were invariably heavy metal guys. They were guys who came out of CS or computer science right. who were, you know, either they stepped forward or they were thrown as the finger in the dike because somebody had technology was a technology problem. And so we needed a tech, we needed a big mean mother of a technology person to fill it who could speak bits and bytes and all that stuff. Um, and then invariably, you know, things began to shift. The second wave, we often began to see academics who moved into these positions and they would hire a strong number two and, 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 uh, and other ways. But the other part also is the technology person may have been the white person in the early days, but often I was at many campuses or heard stories that, you know, due respect to anybody in the audience named Steve, you know, Steve's yeah. been in this position for a long time. He was the right person at the right time, but his time has passed. But we're not ready to vote Steve off the island. Alternatively, Susan is the newly arrived provost, and it's her prerogative or, or president, and it's Susan's prerogative to move the deck chairs in different ways. Mm. And the, the organizational structure that worked for her predecessor may not be the one that she wants. So we can have an abstract conversation about what the role of the CIO is and compare it to corporate environments where those CIOs have far more command and control authority over their organizations than do their counterparts in academic organizations. But at the end of the day, it's these are the, often these titles and the reporting relationships are the prerogative of the folks elsewhere in the C-suite who may, for a variety of different reasons, decide that they want reporting function A or reporting function B. I mean, at the end of the day, the reporting function doesn't matter. As, more important is trust. If I can yeah. walk into an office, if I can build this relationship, if I can have a place in the conversation, even more so than a symbolic place on the table, that to me becomes the essence of the issue. And I, I used to think that yeah. at least in the past, it was a big problem when administrative CIOs were running both administrative and academic computing um, uh, initiatives and stuff. Uh, but I think things have changed. I've gotten uh, better. I don't know how much better. Uh, U of I uh, at least is doing very well since we do have a structure with administrative computing for all of U of I is run separately than academic computing and CIOs for each of the three U of I campuses. Um, I think another reason why it gets better also is because the stronger for schools with stronger leadership in the teaching and learning technology groups, learning spaces, uh, centers for uh, excellence in teaching, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and also because increasingly we're having all kinds of IT governance going on. And if you got a strong faculty center along with a strong subcommittee on teaching and learning or education subcommittee within IT governance, 
uh, they too uh, help shape and reprioritize the way things are and what the campus. I'm not convinced because the other thing I see in my data is a tremendous amount of churn in the structure of academic organizations. Mm. So, so and, and, and let me finish if I may. This goes back also to the issue about evaluation. We do a terrible job about evaluation. We do a terrible job in terms of shameless self-promotion about the value of the investment of the IT. It's not so much ROI in a financial sense. It's a VOI. It's a BOI, benefit of investment, value of investment. But the other data that I look at, which has been consistent year in and year out for more than two decades, we've had a question. Have you reorganized your IT on your campus in the last two years? Some numbers say yes. Do you expect a reorganization in the next two years? Some numbers say yes. And then there's a, a significant overlap that runs for anywhere from 10 to 30 years. And this year, 55% of those who did it expect to do it again. Now, again, any one of a number of issues can help explain that churn and that, that Venn diagram with the overlap. It could be, again, new provost, new president, a retiring CIO. It could be budget issues. But the fact is that a tremendous amount of churn doesn't speak to stability and being able to plan and go forward. We all like certainty. If there's uncertainty in the environment, that doesn't help our efforts to go forward. Very good. Wow, that's a fantastic thank answer. Um, and thank and you. That chart, by the way, that chart showing those data is available as part of the report. Which everyone is probably gonna be reading now instead of, instead of listening to us. Thank you so much, Ed, thank you. Uh, we have another question coming in. And just, just to remind people that uh, you saw Tom and Ed beamed on stage, it's that easy to do. So if you've got a camera. Now, um, our good friend, um, Mike Welker does not have a camera. Uh, or, sorry, he's in a, a low bandwidth situation. So he's typing a question. And this is what that looks like. What do you think the roots are for the issue that ed tech ROI is not rigorously assessed? Are there any proven models or tools out there for an ed tech ROI for student success? So, that, you know, I'm going to speak very candidly here. It's a pain in the ass to do assessment. Mm -hmm. It takes time, it takes money, it takes expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the folks who, who want to do something. I'm a faculty member and I want to create a widget or I want to do something in my classroom. You know, they, they don't are not necessarily supported when they want to do the evaluation. Um, again, a lot of this is driven by opinion and epiphany. Um, it's also the case that they don't necessarily, you know, often these are, uh, I want to say this carefully, these are the acts of individuals. They're orphans. They're not necessarily have institutional support or departmental support. And evaluation takes time. Evaluation, you got to bake it in from the beginning. You can't bolt it on at the end. You have to think about what data, we, what's the question we want to answer? Mm. What's the impact mm. we wish to assess? Mm. This is basic blocking and mm. tackling out of any basic evaluation course. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, what are the mm -hmm. data we need to understand? Well, you need a bucket of demographic data about your students. You need a bucket of environmental data. You need a bucket of data about the intervention itself. And you have to have a bucket of data that says, what are the outcomes we're looking for? And then the question becomes, well, do we compare it against past what we did in the past? If there's some consistency, do we do A-B testing because we've got 30 sections of a widget course and we can look at an intervention in some and not others? Do you have a skilled person available who's willing to make the, who's got the time and make the commitment to run the data? And will anybody pay attention to the data once we have it? This awesome. is structural stuff in academia. You know, ultimately we are in theory all experts, we're all masters. We don't step on each other's toes on these kinds of issues. But if we do so, we do it cautiously, particularly if you are not tenured or you're an assistant, you know, you're an assistant professor or an instructor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and the other part also, the, some of the loudest voices in the room are the ones that, that come from commercial sources. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that they don't do their own testing. I want to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Many of the commercial sources do an incredible amount of testing. If you look at some of the efforts mm -hmm. in adaptive and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. But just because it works in one environment doesn't mean it works in another. Um, thank you. That's a very, very... Um precise and a very uh, rich answer. Mike, thank you for the question. Uh, for everybody else who's here, you can see just, um, it's this direct uh, and straightforward to ask questions. Um, so please do. Um, I would love to hear uh, uh, your thoughts. I want to ask uh, Casey a question of my own uh, to get the, to take this a little, little broader angle. Um, what are some of the other leading issues that uh, campus has surfaced in this current report? Well, so no question security is an ongoing concern. You saw that from the top numbers. Uh, yep. Number two, obviously, was this, the employment issue. We, we are on the verge of what I would characterize, and, and I'm not trying to inflate the language, of a huge crisis of, in terms of IT talent for our infrastructure. You know, the heart of it is not technology. It's the people who make the technology 
manageable, effective on both the, on, on, on both the administrative side as well as the teaching learning side. And it's the case in our survey data that year in and year out, and it was a you know, very high number again this year, 75, 78%. Brian, you flashed it on the screen beforehand. Mm -hmm. of the survey participants who say, we have a hard time hiring and retaining IT talent because we can't keep up with salaries and we can't keep up with benefits. Now, it is the case for years that the IT industry has cherry-picked folks at various times mm -hmm. along the way. That's mm -hmm. increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter, again, from, from if I look at, across the, the data in terms of the institutional demographics and the geographies, small town, large city, large institution, small institution, this is a challenge everywhere we go. And, and I think it's compounded by the fact that uh, not only are we not keeping up, but we're, we're adding more stress to the environment. We used to ask a question on the survey, it kind of comes in and out, about what are the, have you had uh, issues about IT security, you know, hack attacks, lost mm -hmm. drives, other kinds of stuff. And one of them was on employee malfeasance. In other words, you have a bunch of pissed off employees who are creating problems, and that's a stress indicator. Yeah. And that number was at 6 to 10% in, in the years that we did it as well. Oh, yeah. the, the mantra of of doing more with less and doing better is nonsense. That may be, you know, sound good from what, whoever's saying it. It doesn't, it doesn't play well with the folks who actually have to do it. And what used to be some of the joys and the flexibility for many folks who relish working in academic environments, whether it's the collegiality or the tech challenge or anything else, we are just draining that, you know, we, we're just squeezing that out. And there are just too many opportunities in too many other places in terms of salary and benefits and work environment yeah. For folks to stay on campus. So there's the CIOs uh, trying to uh, inform uh, leadership about data, about, sorry, about technology. There's the security problem. There's hiring and retaining fine staff. Mm -hmm. um, are those the big three issues right now? Yeah. But actually, can you bring back up that slide that you had before? That shows that that, that shows the top 10 and shows the numbers. Yeah. Give so me the, the way we do this, this is essentially, we ask the field. This is not a Delphi that some other groups have used. So, and, and the question is, that's right on a scale one to 10, one to seven rather, you know, which are the, the most important, you know, critical IT issues, very important, scale, uh, and, and report the numbers for six and seven. Uh, so you can, and, and what's interesting this year is that there's a big break between the top four and the next six when that slide comes up. So the top four are 60, you know, are, are essentially 71% to 83%. Adequate user support, no surprise about student success. This is. Uh, this goes back, I would argue, to the Spellings Commission, which took higher yeah. ed in, in 2006 to task about access, yeah. affordability, and accountability. But look at the next six. You got a 10 point gap between number four and number five, analytics. Um, I'm, I'm on record through the number of the surveys talking about analytic angst. There's all this conversation about analytics in higher ed. We're not getting our money out of it. And, and we're not doing a good job of explaining what we do. Probably the best story about analytics today in higher ed is Georgia State, right? where after a significant investment in analytics, Georgia State effectively eliminated. Honestly, you got to look at the Georgia State. It's success.georgiastate.studentsuccess.georgiastate.edu. Effectively eliminated the historic retention and graduation gaps among different student populations, first gen, students of color, um, uh, and, and other groups in five years. And the public presentation of that was we did it with analytics. When you talk with Tim Reddit, the VP for uh, at, at, who led this initiative, I interviewed him as part of the Two a Degree series last year. Mm. You, you hear him speak in any public forum. Tim will tell you this was not just that analytics was the front end. They hired 170 people. This was tech-enabled mm. high touch. They had a morning after strategy that said once they sort of ran all these analytics for all these student populations in, in different ways and in different, and then I got the Monday morning email that said, Casey, we've looked at what you're doing and we're watching you carefully. And you know what? You're going down a dark rabbit hole in one, two or three of your courses. Rather than just sending me the stigmatizing email, the email said, and this is how you get out of the rabbit hole. There are people, there are places, there are offices, there are services that can help you. This is tech enabled high touch. You see a similar thing at Arizona State University with their online programs. So yeah, Arizona State's gotten kudos for a very effective, rapidly growing online program, but they've provided infrastructure for those students in the way of support services that makes it work. This, it, it's what I've called for years, tech-enabled high touch. It's not one versus the other. It's the sum, of the, the sum of the parts, which creates a gestalt, which is greater than the sum of the parts.
And that's and we're not getting our value, you know, the bang for the buck. And, and I think that part of the analytic angst is, and I say this cautiously, I'm not naming names, but there's been the case that there's a lot of providers out there who are making great claims for what they do. And some, and many of them are coming in and getting shoved out within a year for falling short. And so whether they're middleware providers who promise us they'll kind of, you know, take the data gumbo from all your stuff and give you the solution and give you the algorithm or provide support services. This is a long process that takes significant time and significant investment and institutional commitment and on the step- part of a variety of folks in C-suites who have to step up and stand up on this issue. And it's not cheap. It's not cheap, and it's not, it's not analytics that's going to solve. It's an institutional commitment that, that, that recognizes analytics as the front end of, of building support services and strategies. What you said earlier, it's not the technology, it's what technology touches. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a... That's a great, great answer. Um, we have uh, more questions coming in, um, and let me just bring up one. Uh, this is from uh, Jeff Alderson, uh, and Jeff from MathWorks asks, do you find that STEM-focused universities are somewhat insulated from some of these tech-related issues, um, talent skills, because they have a built-in source of new talent? It is, Jeff, is the question is about uh, in terms of support staff? I think so. N- not necessarily. I mean, it's the case that campuses have used student talent for years at help desk and in sort of tier one stuff. Mm-hmm. Many campuses uh, have codified that. Not only are you employed, you get a certificate. I, I, let me give a shout out to my friends at Seton Hall who have for years had a student technology assistant program that effectively is on the job training as opposed to just you know, I'm logging hours at the help desk. And a number of other campuses have done this as well. Uh, Paul Fisher, who's the uh, director of the TLT, and, and Steve Labby, the long-serving CIO, have done a great job with this. And I know a number of other campuses have looked at the Seton Hall model. In a world when we're talking about certificates and credentials, that's a great model. But that's short-term. Yeah, some of those students hmm. may stay. Hmm. And there are some problems with, and, and there are some challenges with student workers in terms of their schedules, their necessary, potentially their commitment. You get to be, you know, the time when you, you need the support is around finals, and they too have finals. Right. Uh, there's some issues potentially about security uh, um, in, in terms of at least the concern that these are not university employees, and yet potentially they may have access to uh, secure databases and stu- other kinds of institutional stuff. Students can do a lot, but there are some limits to what students can do. And, and honestly, let's speak candidly, if you're at a campus with a union, uh, you know there, there may be some union rules that limit where you can employ students in certain circumstances. Yeah. So... You know, students, right. students can be a great resource, but it's not a resource that we can depend on as a solution. Well, speaking of students and speaking of analytics, uh, Ed wants to follow up. Ed Gray wants to follow up with another question, which is really, really good. Uh, you mentioned uh, communication. Could you speak, please, to the misuse, abuse, and privacy issues associated with learning analytics? So, so Ed, this is the great fear. You know, much like the campuses that are putting uh, Alexa units in dorm rooms. As a version of privacy, but you know, as a way to enhance services, there are a couple of campuses this year and last year that that put uh, uh, Amazon dots, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and cut, did some custom programming. But the fact is, they're always on; they're always hearing. Uh, there's a great risk, admittedly. Uh, the fact is, at some point, you know, at a legal basis, some part of our student population is always under 18. So, do you have to get parental consent for students who are in classes where we're doing learning analytics? The fact is transparency is the best remedy on all this. Mm. And again, I come back to my earlier com- comment. You start at the front end in terms of all these conversations. What is it we hope to do? What data do we need to collect? Who do we need to inform? You know, it's just, and, and, and this is more than just the kind of pro forma checklist. Oh, it falls under a category three in the IRB process at Acme College. You gotta take time. You gotta think these things through. And, and you know, quite honestly, the other part, I, I, I think there's great wisdom in the comment that um, Scott McNeely at Sun Microsystems offered years ago. Mm. Privacy, forget about it. Right. We have not. You know, so if, if you, I mean, we, we talk about it, but in many ways, you know, we, we, we have implicitly given it away. I mean, honestly, raise, metaphorically, raise your hands. How many of you actually read the agreement every time you get an upgrade on iTunes or any other software application? that allows the provider yeah. to essentially track what you do. You know, how many of you, you know, roll through the, those large screens and just rather than just go to the bottom and say, okay, there some, we've uh, ceded large parts of our privacy. And that's the Faustian deal. 
You know, if you want privacy, stay off of Facebook. Do you think, um, I mean, either yourself in your observations or in the data that your project collects, um, have you seen any presence of rising anxiety about social media and the digital world in general in terms of privacy? I mean, is that impacting? I, just for example, uh, I've been in meetings where I've seen different faculty and staff with uh, laptops, and on one of them, they'll have a laptop that has a sticker saying something about the power of learning analytics. And the next person over will have one saying, don't spy on students. Um, you know, do, do you see that kind of uh, resistance to uh, data analytics popping up in, uh, in your work? Look, we, I, let me provide a little bit of historical context to this, Brian. It's going to be an extra 10 seconds to answer this. In a prior life, I used to be, I was with the Freshman Survey Project at UCLA. This is best known as the Cooperative Institutional Research Project. Mm -hmm. We collected, you know, we, every year at the time I was there from 1982 to 1989, we were surveying over 300,000 students. And to do the follow-up work, and, and the work from the Freshman Survey really is the foundation for the whole student success movement. Sandy Aston was, was an incredible contributor to the understanding in terms of bringing mortal varied analysis and sophisticated mm -hmm. methodologies to the understanding of institutional impact and outcomes. You don't want to run regression analysis for everybody. You run them by separate populations because the populations are different, or otherwise you're gonna get the same outcomes in terms of you know, what are the characteristics of the students who don't succeed. And when I, in, in, in my tenure as the operating officer, as the associate director, we would have conversations with campuses, often with registrars, and in the wake of the Buckley Act, which is now something else, but this goes back to the earliest part about registrars giving up data that we could merge because we wanted transcript data, we wanted majors, we needed some other stuff. And the registrars used to guard over the data the way I stood at the door when my 13 year, 15 year old daughter went out on her first date. You know, and, <laughs> and, and understandably, they should have been protected. But there are ways to do this that are thoughtful, that are responsible, and nonetheless protect the data and the integrity for students. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that, that students, all of us, give up so much of our privacy anyhow, these are kind of afterthoughts to focus on one part of it. The reality is that the, I don't question the good intentions of campus officials and the technology providers that they work with to do individual analytics that says that the, you know, as Georgia State and elsewhere sends me a Monday morning email says, Casey, you're in trouble. Right. Because if, if they want to have an, if you want to design an intervention, ultimately you have to target individuals. You can't just blow it all out. All of you who self-select yourself into a population. You have to intervene. But, you know, effectively, many of us have, by default, in some cases, you know, not by default, have said, okay, I'll participate. Again, if you want privacy, stay off Facebook. Well, that's a good answer. Um, I have some thoughts about this, but I'd, I'd like to hear from everybody else. We, we are down to the last nine minutes or so. So the questions that you have, I mean, think about, for example, um, the different, many different aspects of the campus computing world. Think about the learning management system. Uh, think about the uh, lab supplies. Uh, think about hardware. Uh, think about in reporting structures. Think about the many, many questions you'd like to know about how campuses literally and actually use digital technology. This is your chance to ask. And, uh, and don't at all, um, feel um, that your question might be too strange or too restricted to your own institution. Higher education is a wild and woolly beast with an awful lot of variation. So we'd be glad to hear uh, all of your questions and thoughts. Um, I, I want to ask you to go back to uh, one of your previous points, Casey. Um, I think sometimes you and I are the only ones in educational technology who remember that the Great Recession happened. Um, I mean, no one wants to talk about it anymore, which is interesting, right? Um, just how far down is IT funding in 2019, thanks to the Great Recession? I don't have a hard number. You know, that we're at 85% of where we were versus 2008. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that year in and year out, I see large numbers of campuses, meaning 20 to 30% by sector, who nonetheless, even as we are 10 years past, report they had a budget cut. I see numbers that report they had a budget rescission, and these are compounding consequences because you begin 3% less and then somebody takes another 2.5% or, or you lose 1.5% right. through a major right. budget cut. Um, I, when I did the EDUCOST presentation a week ago, uh, there was a, a, a IT office, a IT leader from a small college saying, well, we, we're having, uh, in the context of demographics, we're thinking about cutting support services. And I said, you're cutting your nose to spite your face. He said, I know that, but how do I convey that to others in the C-suite? Well, as soon as the word goes out that you've cut services and support services, that word's going to go. That word goes on a neural network. 
Yeah. And the word will be out that Acme College is not supporting students, whether it's academic support services mm. or technology support services. Mm. And ultimately, that's a downward spiral. If anything, I would make the argument to at least maintain and potentially improve and be aggressive both in, in offering those services and in the promotion of those services. Well, so word goes out, wait a second, Acme College is doubling down at a time when others are cutting. It's easy. And that word will go out as well. That would be bold. Um, Case, I want to follow up on that, but a whole bunch of questions just popped in. And I want to give people a, a different chance to uh, to speak to their questions. The wonderful Roxanne Riskin asks about online programs, limited physical campuses. How can they innovate in the areas of augmented reality and virtual reality? Roxanne, I'm clueless. I don't know. <laughs> um, I look at our survey data and we ask about AI and AR and VR. What I do know is that ultimately these are things that individual faculty members are going to have to affirm. Um, what's striking to me when I look at our survey data and we ask IT leaders, you know, over the next couple of years, how important will be AI in administrative, AI in, in instructional, VR, AR, other kinds of stuff. The biggest numbers in terms of impending importance come from the administrative stuff. Mm. And, and that's easy to understand. Mm. You know, ultimately, it's going to be bolted in or baked in on the part of a technology provider as right. part of analytics or something else. On the instructional side, these are going to have to be choices that individual faculty members or departments make. And again, you know, we're going to have to figure out, does it make a difference? It looks flashy. It's a bright, shiny object. There may be ways that you can do, but, you know, we, we institutional memory being what it is, we all remember mm -hmm. lots of bright, shiny objects mm -hmm. um, that, you know, crashed and burned or companies that crashed and burned offering bright, shiny objects. So, um, so, so I, I'm cautious about how this works a lot. I, I've seen stuff. I, you know, I've, I've walked through the booths. I've put on the goggles. It's mm -hmm. all intriguing. The question is, how does it scale? And how mm -hmm. does it scale in online programs, which adds a level of complexity to it as well? Yeah. Uh, and how do you evaluate it? I, I'm just uncertain. So that's probably not the answer you wanted, but that's the best answer I can offer. I appreciate the candor and also the turn back to uh, evaluation. Um, we have another question from uh, the excellent Amanda Major. Who asks, are project managers important or in demand within IT and higher education institutions? And should you have an IT background to work in that field? So, Amanda, I'm not sure what, what, when you say project manager, I'm not quite yet. That, that's to me is an ambiguous term. You know, are you talking about managing implementations? Yeah, there's a lot of implementation going on, particularly around ERP systems. Uh, it is the case if you look at my data. We are very slow in the movements of the cloud, much slower than perhaps many anticipated. That's clearly a case for IT project managers, whether you are hired by a campus or you're part of a third party that's working with an implementer. So yes, this is a, a, a big issue, a big opportunity. Um, the, the other issue about project management for IT, particularly on the administrative side, again, our data year in and year out show that a, a fair number of campuses report their over budget or past time on their ERP implementations. The explanation is, that way, if you can see my hands on the yeah. screen. Yeah, we can. Yeah, you know, the technology providers say the campus client wanted customization or was uncertain or gave, you know, came back with slate specs. The campus client says, well, they were unclear about some stuff and overpromised and underdelivered. Mm. So uh, mm. project management is a big part of this, but this is, again, everybody sort of stepping up and getting purple thumbs on both sides of the table in that process towards project management. Brian, I know, I'm gonna take the, the speaker's prerogative um, I know we've got a couple minutes late. I want to come back to the question you, you began with or sort of the accolade you offered me for 30 years. What have I learned in 30 years of this project, if I may? Um, with can, respect for, for those of you who've got questions, can I do that? Um, can you can you take one quick question about before we get to that? I guess you're not going to give me a choice. Go ahead, Brian. Well, <laughs> we, we, I want to make sure that, uh, that everyone gets a chance. Um, so this is from uh, M who asks, do you think that institutions are looking towards online learning as a way to boost enrollment or solve the declining student populations? Those are the flip side of the same coin. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And is and the answer is yes. And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. You know, it's a way to outreach a different audiences you may not necessarily get. I mean, certainly if you look at ASU, if you look at Southern New Hampshire University, um, even more ASU more so than Southern New Hampshire, if you look at a lot of small colleges. Mm -hmm. Um, this, these are about enrollments. I think one of the most striking markets case studies about online is among faith-based institutions. 
Mm -hmm. which is, as I look at these institutions, they are overwhelming. You know, they're they unabashedly clear about their faith-based commitment in their undergraduate programs. Mm -hmm. But the, at least in the, in the sense of rendering a little bit of biblical scripture, render under Caesar, render under Christ. While the undergraduate programs are very much oriented towards that faith-based commitment, the graduate programs are largely or, oriented towards market. But with the added value of saying, well, we are trusted because we are a faith-based provider and right. you can trust us. Right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I see a lot of small faith-based colleges going into online programs. That to me is a really striking market study about what's going on, let alone some of the efforts of others. And some of the, the ongoing com issues about using OPMs. There's some data from the survey about IT officers viewing OPMs very quickly that uh, yeah. uncertain whether it's an effective or viable way to launch and even greater uncertainty about whether the use of third-party providers is a profitable strategy. So let me let me take a couple of seconds just to close. Please. I've been doing this for 30 Please. years. And, mm. and my mantra for the last couple of years as I've talked with audiences like this is to say, look, the technology has changed dramatically over three decades. If you think about what you carry routinely and you look at 18 hours a day compared to what if you started with an IBM PC or a Mac in 1982 or 1984, the technology has gotten wonderful. It's changed dramatically. And yet, as I look at the issues from my survey data and my conversations with campus officers and provosts and presidents, the underlying issues we confront in IT haven't changed. Wow. They're about user support. They're about financing. They're about infrastructure. They're about evaluation and assessment. They're about recognition and reward for faculty members who say, this is part of my scholarly portfolio. And unless we start addressing some of those issues, we're going to, again, just sort of be still in the water. And, and that, to me, is part of the challenge that confronts not just IT leadership, but institutional leadership. That's part of what concerns me when I see our survey data, that only uh, two in five feel that their presidents, provosts, and CFOs are knowledgeable, and 30% of presidents and CFOs are engaged, 40% of CAOs. Uh, it's, again, at the risk of redundancy, folks, it's not the technology, it's what the technology touches, and it touches everything today. Well, well and thanks to you. Uh, we know a lot more about how all those touches work. Um, Casey, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for being a great guest, and I want to thank you and celebrate 30 years of this terrific work. Thank you. That's so very much. kind. Thank you, and my thanks to your audience for, for your time today and, and for letting me ramble a little bit. Well, you, you didn't ramble at all. You're very, very precise. But don't go away, friends. Uh, we have to talk to you about what's happening for the next week. Um, we are uh, starting off. Um, Thank you, by the way, today for uh, for coming in with these questions. Um, this is a rich, rich subject, and there's a lot we can do. Next week on Halloween Day, uh, we're going to be looking at the new Horizon Report information. Uh, we're going to have great guests, Susan Gryak and Malcolm Brown, both who've been guests before, both work with Educause, and we're going to be talking about the latest and greatest news from that. So please come by, and uh, if possible, show up in some costume. Um, this session, that next session, all of our sessions will be on the tinyurl.com slash FDF archive, so you can go back and peruse them. And if you want to keep talking about this stuff, all these great questions about evaluation, how technology has changed, but the issues remain the same, find our groups on LinkedIn and Facebook. Join us on Slack. Keep things going on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, thank you so much for all of your contributions. Thanks to our great guests, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.